Now speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My eldest daughter, which is not the one with the green hair sitting over there, uh, my eldest daughter is about to qualify as a teacher in the great city of Glasgow. And during her many years so far living in that great city, once called the second city of the empire, she's also become heavily involved in improvised theatre. Uh, it's what she kind of does with her, you know, teachers don't have leisure time, whatever time that is. Um, and so we've witnessed her standing in a Glaswegian bar, taking on drunk Glaswegians as they heckle her, and she wins every time. Recently, her little improvised theatre group have been really delighted to get some professional gigs, both in Glasgow and in Edinburgh. And their first show in Edinburgh, which is just a few weeks ago, no one showed up. And they thought, what do we do now? Do we catch the train back to Glasgow? Well, we can't afford that, so it'll be a bus anyway. Um, and then one of them said, what we do is we go out in the streets and we force them to come in. And that's exactly what they did. I mean, okay, they've got a proper circuit in Glasgow of people who know them and follow them. Edinburgh, a different matter. Indeed, my, my daughter, who speaks perfect English, received pronunciation English in Glasgow, is often mistaken for being from Edinburgh. Because, of course, Edinburgh is terribly, terribly posh. Um, and what happened was they garnered an extraordinary, diverse audience of extremely surprised people, courting couples, a very enthusiastic, rough sleeper, and many others who had a great time having been forced to come in to watch extremely wild improv. That band of young men and women were so confident that they had something to share, a story to tell, something to make people laugh, cry and think, that they were completely unafraid to go out into the streets of a foreign city, because Glasgow and Edinburgh don't really talk to each other, and invite everyone to come in. Of course, there is a parable of Jesus that speaks directly to that, but that's not today's gospel. I want to go somewhere different on this first Sunday of Lent. The Israelites in the first reading are, are making a choice about their story, about their identity, about who they are, and about the journey they're on. A wandering Aramean was my father, was my ancestor, sorry, in the inclusive language version. We use. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. My Old Testament tutor used to say, that's the closest to a creed in the whole of the Old Testament. It's about identity before God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. This is how I root myself in history, and that's the journey I'm going on. That's who they are, the pilgrim people of God on their way to glory. And Jesus in the gospel, whatever else he's doing in the wilderness, is grappling with the same issues. What's his story? Who is he? I'm very taken by the suggestion that most of us would really like him to have given in to some of those temptations because then we might have got the kind of God we want, a God who zaps people and a God who sits there putting everything right. Oh dear, no. The God, of course, we know in Jesus Christ is a vulnerable God who comes to serve and not to be served. In the desert, he does wrestle with those extraordinary temptations to, to be a very different kind of Christ, to wield influence, wealth, and power. Maybe the Christ we wish he was. But, but of course, when he comes out of the desert, the Christ we meet is one of the upside-down values of the kingdom. Love, simplicity, and joy for the poor. Now, I want to suggest to each of us that Lent, this great 40 days, is, is a fantastic time to get to grips with our own story, our own identity, to work out who we are, who we are in our relationships and in our relationship with God, to work out what journey we're on and where we feel we're going. I have rarely quoted Dolly Parton from a pulpit, even, and yet, on a long journey north on the M1 a few weeks ago, suffering already from that flu, um, a fantastic interview with Dolly Parton. And the DJ sort of said, you know, what's your philosophy of life? And she said very simply, get to know yourself and then do it on purpose. Get to know yourself and then do it on purpose. I think it's a fantastic line. And of course, it's exactly what Jesus is doing in the desert. Facing his demons, it's a phrase we still use. And then doing it on purpose. He's been baptised, he goes into the desert, and then he begins his ministry of teaching, preaching and healing. Get to know yourself 
and then do it on purpose. I know it's not from scripture, it's from a very famous country singer, but still, uh, it's a great comment on Jesus in the desert and our journey of Lent. A brilliant summary of something very close to the journey of faith and the invitation of Jesus through this Lent to be with him. It's exactly what the Israelites were doing, lost in the desert for 40 years after they crossed the Reed Sea. Exactly what Jesus is doing for 40 days. The number 40 is symbolically important in both those. As he in the desert is getting to know himself and then intentionally following through. Of course, that raises a big question for us. You know, what, what, what is our story? Who are we? Do we know ourselves enough to be in this extraordinary relationship with the maker of worlds? What journey are we on? We all, of course, come with our own individual stories, our own individual journeys. But here together, and it's part of what corporate worship is about, we're seeking to relate our story to the gospel story, to the journey of Jesus to know and understand more deeply that his life is ours. That our job is to go where Jesus goes and to do what Jesus does. To go where Jesus goes and to do what Jesus does. Let's just a brilliant time for each of us to renew our knowledge and understanding so we can better live the gospel story in our day-to-day. Every week, just a couple of examples about resources. Every week we print on the notice sheet the link to the Pray As You Go website. If you've never visited it, do. I think it's the best resource for helping people to root their lives in the scriptures that I've ever come across. Just a ten minute podcast every day. Beautifully crafted to lead us deeper into the mystery of the Lord we seek to follow. And I know it's really old now. I've referred to Pasolini already, but I rewatched The Miracle Maker the other week. Now, those of you who don't know The Miracle Maker, it's, it's, it's clay puppets acting out the life of Jesus. But I think it's immensely compelling. I always make adult confirmation candidates uh, watch it, as it reminds us again that this isn't a two-dimensional words-on-a-page thing. This is living history. This is the story of our faith, this extraordinary reality of the God who comes among us in the person of Jesus. But whatever we do, The encouragement is to use these privileged 40 days to renew our love, to renew our desire for God. Back to that street scene in Edinburgh. A group of young actors going out on the streets to compel people to come in, absolutely confident that they have something to share, a story to tell. Well, the analogy isn't difficult, is it? That's exactly what we're here for. That's what faith's about. Faith not as a set of propositions in our head, but a dynamic compulsion of the heart to share this glorious relationship with a saving God who's done it all for us already. To invite people to join in this extraordinary movement of faith that brings blessing and hope to a broken world. Faith isn't some precious possession, as I've said again and again, that needs guarding, but a gift that needs sharing and for all our inadequacies and fears God has called us you and me to be the church that meets in Chelsea Cathedral and therefore called warts and all to be his heralds his ambassadors sent out to live and work to God's praise and glory we go where Jesus goes and we do what Jesus does that's the pearl of great price the treasure buried in the field the tiny seed that grows to become a great tree. Faith is not like a taste in opera or the kind of football team we support. It's about the extraordinary good news that God has already won our freedom, has loved us with an everlasting love, has broken down the walls that divide us, that we are truly ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. And the God of love we know in Jesus Christ invites us, therefore, to be co-workers in his vineyard. And that vineyard isn't here, it's there. Our day-to-day place God sanctifies as the arena of our discipleship and the place where his love is lived out. To help heal a damaged world by that same love without limit that we see in the crib and on the cross. That we may draw others into the joy, simplicity and mercy that the Lord passionately desires for the whole creation. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.